Hello, uh, welcome to Grade Academy. I'm Stephanie Ledworth and I'm covering the chemistry course. We're doing the first part of this right now. And I uh, want to use this lesson to teach you about the atomic structure, the structure of the atom. And we need to do the historical background in how all of this information was discovered. Now, when you look at an atom, and do apologize, you're gonna to have to see me move myself around a bit to make sure you can see the full screen. So when we look at an atom, this is the image you usually get from junior cert. Most students would actually be able to identify that as the typical drawing of an atom. Uh, you can see that there's a dense cluster of structures in the very center that we call the nucleus. And within that structure, there are two different varieties of structures, one called protons and the other one called neutrons. And you can see these sort of circles and in the boundaries, you seem to see these little structures also moving around and it gives you that impression. This picture does that very well of things that we know as electrons. Now, when we visualize that, it's like second nature to us. But in fact, these things, these atoms are so infinitesimally small that uh, you couldn't ever see those with the naked eye and not even with microscopes, light compound microscopes, nothing. Electron microscopes at their very highest have only recently just exposed them in large clusters. So these are the tiniest things. So how do we know so much about them? Well, a huge amount of scientists worked hard to actually get the idea of it. And they, you know, imagine the atom as a fuzzy sphere and a dense central structure, which I've just said was the nucleus. And we need to know on our course, we have to know a little bit about how they discovered it. So they couldn't just lift it. Now, if I gave you a gift and um, it was gift wrapped um, and you wanted to see what it was quickly without ripping the paper off and you weren't allowed to, you were supposed to imagine it. You could have maybe held it in your hand, shaken it. You'd have an idea of a lot of things that way. And this is really what uh, scientists had to do. And it depended on the pieces of equipment that became available to them. So what I want to do with you now is I want to take you to this history table. Now this history table I made some years ago. And all I want to really do is to draw your attention to what I've done. So here are the people, what they proposed or discovered, what did they say or what is it that it is important and how, if relevant. Now, when you look at the ancient Greeks and the first two, Robert Boyle and the ancient Greeks, we'll come back to them uh, soon enough. But the guy that I want to talk to you about right now, uh, there are three or four of them, is John Dalton. Now, John Dalton is around in 18. I'm going to just make that large enough for you to understand and follow. So John Dalton is around in 1808. The battery, uh, Volta has created it in 1800. So scientists are racing to see what magic it can do. Let me just move myself out of the way for a little bit. Now, he is actually given the credit for discovering his atomic theory or for his idea. Now, the word atom, it wasn't new. The word atom had been suggested by Empedocles and way back, they were all doing the thinking on it. But John Dalton just didn't think about it, even though I've written that there. You don't have to know all of his experiments or anything like that. But he came to a realization and there are a number of things that he said. So the first thing he said was that all matter is made of tiny, that's bold for importance, indivisible. In other words, you can't split it up and indestructible. You can't break it. OK, and the, he called those particles. Now, we know today, of course, that you can break down the atom. And, you know, that's what nuclear bombs are. But at the time, 1808, that was as good as it got because he just had batteries. They were available to him. They were seven years old, eight years old. Now, the other thing he said is we'll call these things atoms, which, as I said, were not unique and that they were unique to each element. Now, what that meant was that hydrogen's atoms 
were all identical and they all did what hydrogens did. And helium and lithium, they were all different from hydrogen. Their atoms were different. Now, he also said that you could neither create them nor destroy them. Okay, well, we know that that's not true anymore either because of radioactivity, but at the time it was accepted. And here was his big thing. When they combine together, more one or more of them to make compounds, they'll do so in fixed whole number ratios. That is critical. So if you were writing on this page, which you have in your hand, um, you would be writing H2O. You wouldn't be writing H4O. H4O doesn't exist. It's a two to one ratio of two hydrogen atoms to one oxygen. And that is what he's going to bow out. That's what he said. And he's actually done well. Now, with the advent of batteries, we're into the next guy. Now, the next guy, his name is William Crookes. He is famous for having discovered what we now know as electrons, but we can't say he discovered them. He saw cathode rays. Now, I'm going to take you over to this picture and enlarge the two pictures much more. So I'm going to do that right now. And you just bear with me for a sec while I do that. Now, and get the two, and I lift myself out of the way completely now for a second. Okay. What he has is glass blown. And when you could blow glass, you could create wonderful things, a bit like light bulbs. This was quite large. It's about this size, you know, it's quite big. And this guy was able to blow glass and then put tiny little wires into one end of them and superimpose a metal Maltese shaped cross. And down here in the blown glass, um, the scientists were able to put a disc and wire out. But the wonderful thing about these blown glasses, you could draw out quite a, a, a lot of the gas in there. So it dropped the pressure and there was a sort of a partial vacuum. So whatever gas was in here, which would have been air, that had a very low pressure and it meant that you could pass electricity through it. So the batteries were here and this part of the battery, which is called the anode, was connected to the positive end. And the disc wire was connected to the battery. Now, when it was switched on, the beam, they didn't know what it was. They decided to call them cathode rays because they were leaving the cathode, which was negative. And whatever it was that was leaving, it traveled in straight lines, just like light does. And the beam was traveling out here and traveling out there. When it hit the anode, it struck the anode and stayed on it. But the ones that didn't quite hit the anode passed on past. And when they hit the globe at the end, they boom and they hit the globe and they actually caused fluorescence. So they glowed. So when you did this in dark light, there was a glow. Now, when William Crookes was playing with that, he also developed this structure here. Now, let's have a look. This is a picture directly from the Leaving Cert exam paper in 2008 or 2000, sorry, in 2015 or 2014. And well, let's have a little look at it because this is literally that as well. The two of them are very closely related. So this is still a glass globe. OK, this is still a glass globe and the air has been drawn out of it. So it's a partial vacuum, low pressure, atmospheric pressure. And this is the cathode and this is the anode, no longer in a cross form. And what happens is you connect this to one end of the battery and this to the other. And this is a paddle wheel, a bit like two railings. And on it, you have the paddle wheel. Whatever this beam did, these cathode rays, they actually moved the pedal and the ped paddle wheel, the pedals, the pedals of the paddle wheel, and it pushed it towards the anode. So whatever it in here underneath it is, the beam of rays moved the paddle wheel towards the anode. So what William Crookes had seen, <clears throat> he showed that some form of radiation he didn't know what it was. He said that some form of radiation passed from the cathode 
to the anode when current passes through a vacuum tube where the air has been sucked out. He calls them cathode rays. Now, he's done a wonderful job and he has set the stage. He walks away. That's as much as he could do. And I want to now tell you about the next guy. So I'm going to go back over here and I'm going to ask you to look at this picture and that one. So this was what was published. Everybody could see it. And a scientist called JJ Thompson took this on board and went a step further. So here we have your battery. I'm hoping that you can see this. I'm going to take it over. His name's JJ Thompson. Now, what he does is he allows the cathode, just like here, he allows the cathode rays to produce a beam. And he has the anode here, just like that's the anode and like that's the anode there. So the beam, so the, the cathode rays are moving along here. And then there's a kind of a little gap, a slit. And when they come along here, they instead of fluorescing, they'll go straight across and they'll leave a little glow here. But when they actually, when JJ Thompson put a negatively charged plate here, this beam actually was repelled. It was deflected, if you like, downwards away. And when this was positive, it seemed to be almost attracted to it. So what he discovered was these cathode rays were negatively charged because opposites attract. Oh, sorry. And opposites attract. And these are negative and this is negative. So they repel. And he could see that on the fluorescence beam actually being pushed downwards. And if he swapped that with that, then this part, the beam would go up here. Now, he is the guy and JJ Thompson, not William Crookes, I skipped Stoney for a second. J.J. Thompson is given the credit for having discovered the electron. He's also given the credit of showing that the cathode rays were negatively charged. Negatively charged. He starts calling them electrons and he calculates the charge to mass ratio, a ratio of the size. Now, you don't have to know how he does that, but you do need to know that he does that. He calculates the charge to mass ratio. So he has literally climbed on the shoulders of William Crookes. Now, William Crookes saw, he called them cathode rays, but it's JJ Thompson that discovered the electron. And he then goes to propose a plum pudding model. Now, I've left a space here for you to draw a plum pudding model. And what it involves, I will, sh I will show you it in a picture in a second. You're drawing one big solid sphere and then smaller solid spheres inside. And you put negative charges in the smaller spheres because what he ID or he envisaged, this is his atomic theory. He envisaged that the atom was a big sphere and embedded, it was all positive and embedded in it were like cherries in a Christmas pudding, plums uh, at that time, plum pudding, that these were negative electrons. Now, JJ Thompson has set the stage and he has helped us with the discovery of the atomic structure. Now, so he has discovered electrons and he has made a model. And his atomic theory remains accepted for a very, very long time. The word electron didn't come from him. Again, that's a Greek word. <clears throat> and the Greek word was actually um, proposed by our very own Irish Johnston Stoney. Now, Johnston Stoney isn't famous for anything else except for when J.J. Thompson had discovered the electron and had made his plum pudding model. Johnston Stoney suggested to the scientific community from his little position in Galway, in University Gal College Galway, UCG, uh, NUIG now as it's known, he suggested that these negative particles that Crookes had called cathode rays and JJ Thompson had found them to be negative and found their char charge to mass ratio, he said, let's call those things, these little negative particles, electrons. And we're proud of that. And because he's Irish and uh, that's what we have to know about him. Nothing else required, as you can see. 
Now, 1911, <clears throat> the Titanic is halfway on its way. There's a lot of things going on and the new development of radioactivity becomes available. And Ernest Rutherford stands into the spotlight. Now, he is being made famous for having discovered the proton and the nucleus. Now, he's famous for two big things, discovering the proton and discovering the nucleus. Now, I'm going to just get as far as here and take you to that detail. So I'm going to just take myself down here for a second. And I want you to have a look at this picture. This is our representation of what we now know an atom is. A big, big wide outer circle and a dense nucleus. But that was not the way it was initially. And this is really important that you, you understand what I'm looking at here. So this is what we know. But as far as anybody else was concerned, there should have been a plum pudding model here. But the new toy was a thing called an alpha particle. And an alpha particle is literally two protons and two neutrons. We didn't know that at the time, but these things were able to be detected if they passed certain things. So when they passed through uh, pieces of paper, they would go right through and they would speckle photographic paper, which was a black sheet, and uh, you could develop it and you could see where the beams went. So what um, Ernest Rutherford did was he took a long line, a thin sheet of gold. He made an assumption that they were only one thick. So I've just drawn three atoms of gold and I've deliberately written 79 plus there because that's what was in the nucleus of every gold atom. Didn't know that at the time. So these guys are sitting um, in a big sheet and what he did was he fired the beam of alpha particles at them. Now he said he thought that the beam would go right through, get a few deflections or they would only go through where there was a gap. What he discovered shocked him and the scientific community because the most important thing is most passed straight through undeflected. So all the beams, if you can look at this arrow, that beam's gone through, that beam's gone through, that beam's gone through. But then sometimes they went at a large angle. They some, so most went straight through. Some were deflected at large angles. Now, what were they hitting that would make a beam like this one was going straight through? And why was this one suddenly taking a, a bit of a nosedive? And then people couldn't work out. So the detectors, the photographic detector, one day Geiger and Marsden were walking down the corridor and they met Ernest Rutherford and they said, there's huge deflections and for some reason, and Rutherford could never explain why, he said, put the detector back behind the actual alpha emitter. So the alpha emitter is coming from this side and they're going that way. And they had all the photographic plates and the detectors, the Geiger counters over on this side and all the way around. But for some reason, he suggested they put them back here. And what they saw was occasionally some beam actually came straight back. Can you see this beam hitting the something? They didn't know about the nucleus yet. And then coming straight back. Now that blew his mind. Now the Department of Education have a wonderful little simulator. And it was given to all the science teachers a long time ago. And I want you to see it now for a minute or two. This is the photographic paper. And this is the gold foil. Now, this sheet has been opened up and it sits down here along the bottom. And what we want to do is we want to see the beam of alpha particles coming through, hitting the gold foil. And as you know, most go straight through and they will leave speckles here. So what I want to do is I want to make this rather fast. So I want to make it quite strong, relatively high, and I want them to remain. I want the beams to remain. So I want you to just quickly have a look. The beam is going through here. And as you can see, most of the beams are going there. Now, you should also see that each speckle is registering. That is there. Now, you can see that most of the green specks are actually there. 
But you will find, if I left this running, that there's a few now starting to appear right out here. And if you did this for long enough and then you developed them, you would find a few out there. And mathematically, and a few over here, you can see there's one there. So that might have been there or over here. And if I were doing this really small, slowly, one will actually see that going all the way back. And you will find specks here and specks there as well. So this actually proved that something was in there. Now I'm going to minimize that. So what he said was, here were the three observations. Most passed straight through. Some were deflected at large angles. And a few were repelled back. Now he concluded, there is three observations. His conclusion is, since most went straight through, practically all of the atom must be empty space or isn't stopping the alpha particles. How did he know that this middle part was so small? Because very few were repelled back. And how did he know that they were positively charged? Well, he knew that the alpha particles were positively charged, so like repelled like. So if this was positively charged, something in the center must have been it. So what did he do? He bombarded thin gold leaf foil with alpha particles and detected these particles around the foil. Most were only slightly deflected bombard it until he released protons. Now, what he also is famous for having said, he said it's like shooting a gun at a tissue and it coming back, shooting a bullet at a tissue and it turning back, the bullet turning back and hitting you. Now, at the time, 1911 or 1912 or 13, uh, machine guns weren't actually uh, developed until, you know, right into World War I. I think. I'm not entirely sure about that. But I think it'd be more appropriate for him to have said, it's like firing a machine gun at a tissue paper and practically all of the bullets going through, but then just one turning around and coming back. That's more like the truth. Because remember, most of the stuff went through. Now, when we look at this, we have JJ Thompson with his plum pudding model. That had been accepted until this moment. And then suddenly we have Ernest Rutherford, the New Zealander, who bombarded gold foil and he found that there must be a nucleus. And later he finds the proton. So he showed that the atom was mostly space with a dense nucleus and he bombarded the atom's nuclei and eventually pushed out positive particles, which he called protons. Now I'm going to stop the lesson there. So you know about Ernest Rutherford, you know about our good old JJ Thompson and his plum pudding model. And you also know about Johnston Stoney deciding to call those electrons, electrons. And you also know about William Crook who first saw the electrons but called them cathode rays. And John Dalton who was the first one to actually describe an atom. So I hope you found this useful and I want you to know, as I was saying, that um, I want you to thank you for watching the Great Academy lecture. Next time I'm going to finish the atom history and then go on to describe how elements were also classified as they are. Okay. Thank you. Until next time, happy learning.